Hello, and welcome to Nightmare Masterclass. My name is David Stockdale. I'll be your host on this excursion into the dark unknown. I'm doing something a little different in this installment. This time around, I won't be analyzing any one piece of media. Rather, I'd like to discuss the broad history of a very important topic, nuclear weapons. A lot has been made recently of the so-called mother of all bombs, MOAB for short, recently dropped in Afghanistan. This weapon is cited as the most powerful non-nuclear weapon in the U.S. arsenal. And yes, that's true. It's a massive bomb. The MOAB was employed to take out a series of tunnel complexes used by ISIS in eastern Afghanistan. Afghan officials reported that 94 ISIS militants were killed in the strike. And this move seems remarkably consistent with President Trump's promise to, quote, bomb the shit out of ISIS. I would bomb the shit out of them. <laughs> Our president's lack of articulation on this topic aside, the deployment of the MOAB should be considered in the context of history. I certainly don't want to downplay the significance of this recent strike in Afghanistan, but it should be noted that the destructive capability of the mother of all bombs simply pales in comparison to even the very first atomic weapons used in World War II. The MOAB contains about 11 tons of explosive power. Just to give you some perspective, the bombs dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki contained around 15,000 tons of explosive power. Moreover, the MOAB reportedly killed 94 ISIS militants. It's estimated that the atomic bomb dropped in Hiroshima in 1945 killed somewhere between 90,000 and 160,000 people, many of them instantaneously. And the Atomic Heritage Foundation estimates that the bomb eventually killed more than 235,000 people when those killed from radiation poisoning were included in the total figure. And it should be noted that radiation poisoning is an excruciating way to go. Since then, nuclear weapons have become considerably more powerful. In fact, today's nuclear weapons possess a destructive force thousands of times greater than the bombs dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This fact should be terrifying to anyone with a brain. I'm not pointing this out to get in a pissing contest about the biggest bombs of all time. I'm pointing it out because it's an issue that is critical to understand if you have any hope for the future of humanity. The stakes of escalating warfare in this day and age are greater than they've ever been before. In this installment, I'll be highlighting one symbolic tool used largely in reference to the threat of nuclear weapons, the Doomsday Clock. The Doomsday Clock is maintained by an organization called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, specifically their Science and Security Board. The clock is used to represent the likelihood of global catastrophe. The closer we are to midnight, the greater the chance of worldwide annihilation. A group of international researchers called the Chicago Atomic Scientists started the Bulletin. They were participants in the Manhattan Project. Many such participants felt conflicted about the project due to the overwhelming destructive potential of the weapons they were developing. Upon witnessing a test blast prior to the bombs dropped in Japan, physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer recalled a verse from the Hindu holy book, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. A year or so after the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Chicago atomic scientists began publishing the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and the Doomsday Clock was depicted on every cover. The clock was first set in 1947. The board positioned the clock at 7 minutes to midnight. Since then, the board has been repositioned 22 times at various points throughout history, sometimes backwards and sometimes forwards depending on the situation. This chart graphs the movements of the Doomsday Clock from its creation in 1947 to 2017. The lower points in the graph represent a shift towards Doomsday, and the higher points represent a shift away from Doomsday. Usually when the bulletin repositions the clock, the move is indicative of some major world event, such as the signing of a non-proliferation treaty, or an increase in tension between nations that possess nuclear weapons. Let's go over the timeline point by point. In 1949, Russia tested its first atomic weapon, officially starting the nuclear arms race. Thus, the clock was moved four minutes closer to midnight. At this point, the clock was positioned at three minutes to midnight. In 1952, the U.S. tested its first thermonuclear weapon. It produced a yield of 10.4 megatons of TNT. 
That is significantly more powerful than the bombs dropped in Japan. Russia followed suit a few months later with their own thermonuclear bomb, and the board moved the clock one minute closer to midnight as a result. At this point, the clock stood at two minutes to midnight. This is the closest in history we've ever been to total nuclear annihilation, according to the bulletin. Several events occurred in the following years that pushed the clock back, away from doomsday. Due to the increased public awareness of the dangers associated with nuclear weapons, as well as increased scientific cooperation, the United States and the Soviet Union worked in conjunction with one another to avoid conflict, most notably during the Suez Crisis of 1956. And in 1957, the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs occurred. This event was one of the first to present the opportunity for interaction between American and Soviet scientists. Between 1957 and 1958, scientists from a number of countries established the International Geophysical Year, a coordinated series of scientific observations between scientists from countries allied with both the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Because of these various occurrences, the board pushed the clock back five minutes, setting it at seven minutes to midnight. And in 1963, the United States and Russia signed the Partial Test Ban Treaty. This agreement put a limit on atmospheric nuclear testing. Notably, this treaty did not ban underground testing. Nonetheless, the agreement represented an acknowledgement that these two superpowers must work together to prevent global annihilation. As a result, the clock was pushed back to 12 minutes to midnight. Another series of events prompted the bulletin to push the clock closer to midnight. The Indo-Pakistan War of 1965 took place, as well as the Six-Day War in 1967. U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War intensified in these intervening years. In addition, France and China, both nations that hadn't signed the Partial Test Ban Treaty, acquired nuclear arms in order to maintain a presence in the global arms race. As such, the clock was positioned at 7 minutes to midnight. The bulletin stated, There is a mass revulsion against war, yes but no sign of conscious intellectual leadership in a rebellion against the deadly heritage of international anarchy. The clock took a swing back in favor of civilization when, in 1969, every nation in the world save for India, Pakistan, and Israel signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, NPT for short, with the intention of preventing the spread of nuclear weapons and promoting the peaceful use of nuclear energy. The NPT put the obligation on nuclear powers to take measures in good faith to eliminate nuclear weapons. However, it should be noted that no one governmental body has the power to enforce this treaty. It relies solely on the honor system. But the bulletin considered the treaty a step in the right direction and the clock was positioned at 10 minutes to midnight as a result. In 1972, the U.S. and the Soviet Union signed two additional treaties, the first Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, SALT for short, and the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, the ABM for short. SALT limited the number of ballistic missile launchers possessed by either the U.S. or Russia, and the ABM worked to halt the arms race in defensive nuclear weaponry. As such, the board moved the clock back two minutes further from doomsday positioning it at 12 minutes to midnight. However, in 1974, India tested its first nuclear weapon. In addition, talks stalled between Russia and the U.S. regarding the second iteration of the Strategic Nuclear Arms Treaty. In addition, both the U.S. and the Soviet Union modernized their multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles, MARV for short. As a consequence, both countries were able to load more nuclear warheads into their missiles. The bulletin moved the clock three minutes closer to midnight as a result, positioning it at nine minutes to midnight. The second Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty talks eventually ended, and in 1980, the Soviet-Afghan War began. In consideration of the Soviet Union's presence in Afghanistan, the U.S. Senate refused to ratify the second treaty. The clock was pushed two minutes closer to midnight as a result, positioning it at seven minutes to midnight. Tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union continue to increase the likelihood of complete nuclear annihilation. A number of events occurred that prompted the bulletin to move the clock an additional three minutes closer to midnight 
in 1981. In response to the Soviet war in Afghanistan, President Jimmy Carter decided to boycott the Summer Olympic Games held in Moscow. Additionally, the Carter administration considered ways in which the U.S. could win an all-out nuclear war. Then, in January of 1981, Ronald Reagan was elected U.S. president. Reagan took a more hardline approach with Russia, stating that the only way to end the Cold War was for the United States to win it. His administration scrapped ongoing talks with the Soviet Union about the reduction of nuclear arms. The Bulletin did not see this news as promising. In consideration of this shift, the clock was positioned at four minutes to midnight. In 1984, the Soviet-Afghan War intensified and continued to cause tension between the United States and the Soviet Union. The U.S. deployed perishing two medium-range ballistic missiles, as well as cruise missiles, in Western Europe. Moreover, Russia opted to boycott the 1984 Olympic Games held in Los Angeles in response to the U.S. boycott in 1980. As a result, the clock was moved forward one minute, standing at three minutes to midnight. But in December of 1987, the clock moved back three minutes due to the signing of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, an agreement between the United States and the Soviet Union to eliminate the use of intermediate range nuclear missiles. And in 1990, the fall of the Berlin Wall, as well as the Iron Curtain, along with the reunification of Germany, indicated that the Cold War was reaching its end. The clock was moved four minutes back as a result. In 1991, the U.S. and Russia signed yet another treaty, the First Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. In December of that year, the dissolution of the Soviet Union occurred. In response, the bulletin moved the clock back another seven minutes. At this point in history, the clock was positioned at 17 minutes to midnight. The furthest the clock has been from midnight since its creation in 1947. Yet, despite the end of the Cold War, global military spending continued at the same levels due to concerns about the proliferation of weapons in post-Soviet Russia. As such, the clock was pushed forward three minutes in 1995, leaving the clock sitting at 14 minutes to midnight. In 1998, India and Pakistan tested their nuclear weapons only three weeks apart from one another. In addition, the U.S. and Russia reached difficulties in efforts to continue reduction of their respective nuclear arsenals. In response, the bulletin moved the clock forward another five minutes, positioning it at nine minutes to midnight. And in 2002, due to a lack of progress made in global nuclear disarmament, the clock was moved forward another two minutes. At this point in history, the U.S. rejected a number of arms control treaties and withdrew from the anti-ballistic missile treaty signed in 1972. The U.S. cited concerns about the possibility of a nuclear attack carried out by terrorists due to the amount of nuclear arsenals unaccounted for around the world. At this point, the clock stood at seven minutes to midnight. North Korea tested a nuclear weapon in 2006, though U.S. officials suggested the blast might have been a nuclear explosive that misfired. During this time, the U.S. showed no inclination in ramping down its nuclear arsenal. Among both the United States and Russia, some 26,000 nuclear weapons still existed. In addition, the international community was concerned about Iran's intentions to obtain a nuclear bomb. In 2007, the bulletin added climate change to the roster of the greatest threats to humankind. The bulletin cited damage to ecosystems already taking place at that time, such as flooding, drought, and powerful storms. As such, the clock was pushed an additional two minutes closer to doomsday. At this point, the clock was positioned at five minutes to midnight. In 2010, with a follow-on to the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty in the works between the United States and Russia, as well as additional reductions planned between the two nations, the bulletin's assessment was considerably more optimistic. In addition, efforts to combat climate change at this time, specifically evidenced in the 2009 UN Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen, looked promising. The bulletin moved the clock back one minute, positioning it at six minutes to midnight. But in 2012, the bulletin cited lack of further political cooperation to address climate change 
as well as nuclear weapons stockpiles and its decision to move the clock back one minute. Three years later in 2015, the board moved the clock back an additional two minutes, again, citing concern over climate change in addition to the modernization of nuclear weapons in the United States and Russia. The pernicious matter of nuclear waste was also cited in their decision to reposition the clock at three minutes to midnight. The Science and Security Board warned, the probability of global catastrophe is very high, and the actions needed to reduce the risks of disaster must be taken very soon. In January of 2017, the board moved the clock forward half a minute, positioning the clock at two and a half minutes to midnight. In large part, they cited President Donald Trump's reckless comments on the topic of nuclear warfare. They also cited the rise of nationalism around the world, the renewed threat of an arms race between the United States and Russia, as well as the Trump administration's stance on climate change. Notably, this is the first time the board has used a fraction of a minute in its estimation. More importantly, it's the clock's closest turn to midnight since 1953. Let's talk numbers. While the precise quantity of warheads in each country's arsenal is usually kept secret, here's a breakdown based on data from the Federation of American Scientists. In March of last year, Russia led the U.S. in terms of nuclear firepower, with a total of 7,300 warheads, though the U.S. isn't too far behind with 6,970 nuclear warheads. In total, these global superpowers possess enough nuclear warheads to lay waste to the surface of the Earth nearly four times over. The doomsday clock certainly isn't perfect, and the bulletin of the atomic scientists are not soothsayers, nor are they psychics. Notably, the board did not move the clock during the Cuban Missile Crisis, a time when the world was in true peril from the threat of an all-out nuclear war. The clock is not set in real time as events transpire. Rather, members of the board meet twice annually to deliberate on the setting of the clock. In their meeting, they consider how close we are to the end of civilization. The clock's position is their best guess at how close we are to doomsday based on current global trends. They can't predict the future. What they can do is use their knowledge of science, politics, and current events to make an assessment based on their understanding of these various threats. As we've seen from these historical shifts, international scientific cooperation is a good thing, and non-proliferation agreements between global superpowers are certainly a good thing. Nuclear powers adhering to these treaties is an even better thing. Of course, measurable reduction in the amount of nuclear arms on this planet is the ultimate goal. These events are recognized as shifts away from the paradigm of nuclear arms being viewed as a viable means of war. When world powers commit to halting nuclear proliferation, the likelihood that humanity will blow itself back to the Stone Age diminishes. Conversely, tension between nations with nuclear capabilities is a bad thing. Nuclear powers breaking their word with respect to non-proliferation treaties that they themselves have signed is also a bad thing. Nations backing out of coordinated efforts to make new non-proliferation treaties is another bad thing. These events directly increase the likelihood of nuclear war, and as such, they represent a shift towards doomsday. As of late, some of the rhetoric from our leaders about nuclear arms has been a point of concern for these scientists. But, as stated, the doomsday clock has come not only to represent the threat of nuclear war, but also the threat posed by climate change. And the rise of certain anti-science political groups is certainly not promising. The fact that the bulletin thought to move the clock closer to midnight now should be a cause for alarm. All too often, the mainstream reaction against legitimate existential threats is both apathy and denial. And it's understandable why these tend to be the knee-jerk reactions of the public at large. After all, it is difficult to go about your day with the knowledge that the fate of your family, friends, colleagues, and indeed the collective fate of humanity rests in the hands of an aging, orange-faced snake oil salesman who oftentimes can't string together a series of coherent sentences, much less make an eloquent remark about the use of nuclear weapons. Theoretical physicist Lawrence M. Krauss and retired Navy Rear Admiral David Titley wrote a New York Times op-ed on behalf of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. 
In the piece, they stated, Never before has the bulletin decided to advance the clock largely because of the statements of a single person. But when that person is the new president of the United States, his words matter. With the consequences of something like nuclear warfare so dire, we should be ramping down our nuclear supply, not building it up. And this basic tidbit of common sense should be matched in the rhetoric of our president. Sometimes it appears the doomsday clock would be more aptly described as a pendulum, the likelihood of an end to global civilization swinging back and forth with the fickle, chaotic trends of history. Now, world leaders are either impotent, powerless to affect positive change, or so horribly misguided on the issue of nuclear proliferation so as to render them a distinct threat to humanity itself. In President Donald Trump's case, I dare say it's the latter. I don't have something comforting to say at this point. I wish I did. In short, who we elect to be president matters, and their rhetoric on the topic of nuclear war absolutely matters. President Trump's numerous remarks on this matter have been both thoughtless and demonstrably harmful. The U.S. sets the standard for the rest of the world. And if the president publicly views nuclear weapons as a legitimate means of war, other countries, including those who are not allies with the United States, will follow suit. That wraps it up for this installment of Nightmare Masterclass. In the next installment, uh, I don't have a joke for this one. Um, thanks for watching, and good night.